What if events went differently in Avengers 2012? What if the X-Men were the heroes in Avengers 2012? Now, what do you think would have happened if the Avengers had never been? What if it was another team of heroes that had to fight Loki and the Jatari? Now, this what if is going to be very interesting as we will be diving into a variant world. Now, it's not going to fully be the Fox X-Men universe, but I might be taking bits and pieces and forming a team known as the X-Men. Now, this is a variant world where we could have it in Earth 838, but I really wanted to dive deep into this really interesting interesting reality and see what would have happened if the X-Men were pinned against the Jatari army during Avengers 2012 and what would have happened during the invasion. Now that being said, my fellow watchers of the multiverse, I'm super excited to dive into this video and I cannot wait. Like I'm I'm very excited. A lot of people requested for me to do this. Now it's going to be a very interesting video and I do want to say if you guys are interested in seeing more content, do make sure to check out the Patreon as it's starting at just $6 a month and you can get so many different videos and content. There's so many videos that are going to be coming out in the coming months and I'm very glad to, you know, finally have more content coming out for you guys because it has been a while. But that being said, my fellow watchers, let's dive in to the brand new Marvel's What If episode. Professor X found himself in a perplexed situation when he received an unexpected invitation from a long lost friend. This friend who had built his own formidable fortress and assembled a mighty army to protect humanity from extraterrestrial threats had extended the summonings that left Professor X bewildered. His friend possessed a vast arsenal pooled with unimaginable resources and led a team of powerful and ferocious individuals. The question that loomed in his mind was why would someone so well prepared need his assistance. Wolverine, always one to be cautious, suggested that Professor X bring someone along for the upcoming meeting with his enigmatic old friend. However, Professor X was resolute in his decision to embark on this journey alone. Determined to uncover the mysteries that lay behind the invitation and to understand if the looming threat exceeded the magnitude of his friend's impressive preparations. The sleek blackbird touched down gracefully on the massive helicarrier, its engines humming softly as it settled onto the landing pad. With a hiss of hydraulics, the automatic doors of the aircraft slid open, revealing a figure in a wheelchair. Professor X, Charles Xavier, descended from the ramp, his presence commanding respect even before he spoke a word. The helicarrier staff members were well equated with the routine. They rushed forward to receive Professor X. They guided his wheelchair with pristine ease, leading him through the bustling corridors towards the heart of the carrier. Finally, they arrived at Nick Fury's office. The director of S.H.I.E.L.D. welcomed Professor X with a firm handshake and a warm smile. By merely seeing you, I feel half my worries are solved. Nick Fury remarked. His voice tingled with relief. In response, Charles mustered a slight smile, a substantial gesture achieved by the clenching of his lower lip. It was the most he could offer anyone in courtesy. Emotion had long since died within him during his journey, one filled with pain and sorrow that had forged him into a formidable figure he had become. Professor X sat in Nick Fury's office a sense of surprise lingering in his mind. Why had Fury called upon him for help? It hinted at a crisis that might be beyond even the capabilities of the mighty Avengers team. Fury's weathered forehead frowned with countless wrinkles as he spoke, his tone grave. Things have spiraled out of control, he admitted, his frown deepening. The Avengers find themselves trapped in a time loop a days of future past scenario, and there's no clear path for their return from this alternate realm. 
As a result, I'm left with the one Avenger, the Hulk, who's become more of a danger to his own team than to our enemies. That's why the others had to leave him behind in the present. The dire situation became even more apparent as Fury continued. Under the direction of Thanos, Loki has orchestrated a plan to invade Earth with his formidable Jatari army. It's a threat that we can't underestimate, Professor. That's why I've called upon you. Fury explained, his voice carrying the weight of an impending danger. I need to discuss the possibility of borrowing your team to stand against Loki and his Jatari forces until the Avengers find their way back. Professor X nodded gravely, fully comprehending the gravity of the situation presented. However, he harbored reservations about the proposal. The X-Men's primary mission had always been to foster harmony between humanity and mutants. Their ongoing conflict with Magneto and his team had been aimed at distilling mutant extremism and maintaining a dedicated balance in human-mutant relations. In his view, engaging in battle against extraterrestrial invaders was not their intended role. Professor X couldn't hide his ignorance regarding the capabilities of beings like Thanos and Loki. Their ability to travel billions of light years to Earth seemed like an impossibility to him. The idea of such powerful extraterrestrial entities was challenging for him to grasp. However, Nick Fury had more to reveal. He disclosed that his organization, SHIELD, had successfully located the mysterious Tesseract device. This wasn't just an artifact, it was a gateway to an entirely new world known as Asgard. Fury explained that if the Tesseract were to fall into the hands of Loki, his unparalleled power would enable him to unleash devastation upon Earth. Professor X, though, still focused on his primary mission of maintaining harmony between humans and mutants, couldn't dismiss the imminent threat posed by Loki in the Tesseract. He was convinced by Fury's assignment and recognized the grave danger that Earth faced. Nevertheless, his enduring concern remained Magneto, his arch nemesis, and the ongoing struggle between mutants and humans that threatened to disrupt the delight balance he had been tirelessly working to uphold. Professor X was keenly aware of the risks associated with leaving the field open for Magneto, recognizing that he posed a significant threat to global stability, much like Loki and his Jatari army. Despite his reservations, Professor X made a commitment to Fury. He would gather his team members and engage in a thrilled discussion, weighing the far-reaching implications of their involvement in this interstellar conflict. The decision would not be made lightly, for it had the potential to disrupt the delight equilibrium they had been tirelessly striving to achieve between humans and mutants. As the conversation concluded, Professor X stated firmly, I cannot in good consciousness leave the fate of the world in the hands of Magneto. It is a risk we can't afford to take, even if it means facing the threat of an alien invasion. Nick Fury, equally resolute, posed a chilling question. What if those aliens collaborate with Magneto as a worst case scenario? Professor X gazed thoughtfully through Fury, contemplating the gravity of the situation. With that, he departed for his Xavier mansion. Aboard the Blackbird, Nick Fury had cast a pebble into the calm waters of their lives, creating ripples that would inadvertently lead to a decision, one that would have far-reaching consequences and hopefully work in Fury's favor. Professor Xavier returned to his mansion and convened a meeting with his trusted team members, Beast, Wolverine, Storm, Deadpool, and Jane. The members of the team were understandably hesitant about getting involved in another war, given the losses that they had suffered in their last battle against Magneto. The scars from that conflict were still fresh. However, Jean with her unique abilities to sense the future, had an unusual feeling about the unfolding events. She believed there was more at stake that meant the eye. 
With a sense of urgency, she turned to Professor X and suggested that he use his powers to discreet probe Loki's mind for information. Professor X gently shook his head, explaining the limits of his telepathic abilities. I can only track humans with my telepathy abilities, not any aliens, Gene. Beast, always the strategic, proposed an alternative plan. He suggested that they station some team members at the SHIELD headquarters, where the Tesseract device was being kept. This would allow them to monitor the situation closely and intervene if necessary. Professor X considered Beast's suggestion carefully and eventually nodded in agreement. Very well, he said. Beast and Deadpool, you will be our eyes and ears at the SHIELD headquarters. Keep a close watch on the Tesseract and report any suspicious activity immediately. With their roles assigned and a plan in motion, the X-Men prepared to face the looming threat posed by Loki and the potential chaos that could result from the power of the Tesseract falling into the wrong hands. Loki, in his original form, had cleverly concealed himself by taking up a bartending job in one of the bustling bars in New York City. This allowed him to move freely among the humans without drawing attention, a stark contrast to his brother Thor's noticeable presence. As he mixed drinks and served customers, his mind was constantly at work, devising his next scheme after arriving on Earth, with the intention of stealing the Tesseract device from the SHIELD headquarters. Loki knew that to accomplish his mission, he needed powerful allies. Rumors had reached about him about Magneto, a formidable mutant with nefarious designs against humanity. Determined to secure a partnership that would further his goals, Loki turned to the internet to track down Magneto's current whereabouts. His digital search yielded intriguing results. He discovered that Magneto had established the island nation of Giamasha as a sanctuary for mutants, a place where they could live in peace, far removed from anything else. They often faced at the hands of humans. Loki pondered on the implications of this discovery, considering whether Magneto could be the ally he sought in his quest to obtain the Tesseract and his plans on Earth. The stage was set for a potential collaboration between two formidable forces each with its own agenda and the power to reshape the world. Loki, armed with the information he had gathered from the web, skillfully astral projected himself to Giamasha, the mutant sanctuary. There, in one of the grand combat arenas, he discovered Magneto deeply engrossed in training with his Brotherhood of Mutants, preparing for the impending war. In this expansive arena, mutants could engage in controlled combat scenarios, testing and enhancing their combat-oriented powers. Holographic opponents, capable of mimicking a wide range of adversaries, challenged the mutants, adapting to their tactics and pushing them to innovate and adapt in return. Safety measures were in place to ensure the participants' well-being during these intense training sessions. As Loki materialized before the Brotherhood in the midst of their practice arena, they reacted swiftly, launching a barrage of attacks with their superhuman abilities. Yet, to their astonishment, Loki remained untouched, unaffected by their onslaught. With an air of confidence, he calmly informed them, You cannot touch me. I'm invincible. His words hung in the air, casting a mysterious aurora over the Brotherhood of Mutants, who were left to wonder about the enigmatic figure that had suddenly appeared before them, seemingly improvising to their extraordinary powers. Magneto descended gracefully onto the scene, hovering on his metal object with a regal presence, his distinctive steel helmet adding to his imposing image. He didn't immediately engage in combat with Loki, but rather inquired about the stranger's identity. In response, Loki adopted a charismatic demeanor, 
explaining that he hailed from a distant realm known as Asgard. He said to Magneto, I recount tales from my childhood stories of a man with the extraordinary abilities to manipulate metals. Are you the one, the god of earthly metals? However, Magneto didn't seem swayed by the flattery, and pressed for the reasoning behind Loki's visit. Loki, the silver-tongued trickster, introduced himself as the son of Asgard, and his mission. He aimed to subdue the humans, and launch an attack on Earth with his formidable Jatari army. It was clear he saw Magneto as a crucial ally in the war against humanity. Magneto, always a pragmatic and cautious leader, had initially questioned the authority of Loki's powers. In response, Loki decided to demonstrate his formidable abilities. Without a shadow of a doubt, he materialized into a physical form, right in front of Magneto, shining a scepter with an air of authority. With a swift commanding gesture, he seized control of one of Magneto's own team members, compelling them to proclaim Hail Loki. The mutant obliged, raising the Solon in support of Loki. However, before the display could continue, Loki invoked his magical prowess, utilizing the casket of ancient winters. With a wave of his hand, he froze the mutant in place, encasing them in ice. Magneto, both impressed and cautious, finally exclaimed, Enough! Loki, always the master of deception, decided to further demonstrate his abilities. He transformed into an imitation of Magneto, echoing his words, enough. It was a cunning display of mimicacy that showcased his shape-shifting talents. With a flourish, Loki returned to his true form, prompting the room's occupants to fix their attention on him. He posed a straightforward question to assemble Brotherhood of Mutants. Do you need more? The room was filled with a sense of awe and respect, as the Brotherhood members were thoroughly impressed by the sheer magnitude of Loki's superhuman abilities. Magneto, now willing to entertain the idea of an alliance, spoke with authority. Very well, he declared. We can forge an alliance against the humans, but on one condition. I want control over my adversary mutants. In return, we will support your cause. Loki, fully understanding the significance of this condition, nodded in agreement. On the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier, Nick Fury was deeply engrossed in a new project, one involving the development of powerful weapons, utilizing the Tesseract as a deterrent. Clint Barton, the head of the scientist team, delightedly oversaw the details of this ambitious endeavor. In the meeting hall, tensions ran high as Beast and Deadpool, each with their own unique abilities, discussed the project's implications. Bruce Banner, the only other member of the Avengers team present, sat across from them, his quiet demeanor hinting at the dormant power within him. Deadpool, known for his irrelevant humor, couldn't resist making a cue about his predicament. I must be pretty unlucky, caught between two inhuman characters, like Hulk and Beast, he mused, half jokingly, half seriously. He suspected that Professor X might have orchestrated the situation as a form of payback for some past mistakes. Bruce Banner, feeling the weight on the comments, slammed his fist onto the table in frustration. I'm not a beast like him, he declared. His voice tightened with anger. I am the Hulk. Deadpool decided to push the boundaries further. Yeah, you're right, he retorted, testing the Hulk's patience. There is a difference. At least Beast doesn't go around beating up his own team members. Bruce Banner angrily boiled over, and in a flash of transformation, he became the Hulk. With a ferocious roar, he seized Deadpool and slammed him onto the table, causing the room to tremble from the sheer force of the impact. The room fell into the stunned silence as the Hulk made his point clear. He demanded respect even in his human form, and especially when provoked. The situation in the meeting room 
escalated quickly as Beast attempted to intervene and calm the Hulk down. However, the Hulk, in his towering rage, shoved Beast aside, further fueling the tension in the room. In retaliation, Beast lashed out at the Hulk, launching himself onto the Hulk's head and driving his dagger-like nails into the green behemoth's mouth. Just as the conflict seemed to spiral out of control, Nick Fury, the unflinching director of S.H.I.E.L.D. made a sudden appearance. He took a deep sign and addressed the room sternly, his voice cutting through the echoes. We are not gathered here for some wrestling, gentlemen. We are in the middle of a war, and the fate of humanity depends on us. Nick Fury's words had a somber effect on the room. The tension slowly dissipated as Hulk's anger subsided, and he transformed back into the calmer form of Bruce Banner. With the imminent crisis diffused, the group refocused their attention on the pressing matter at hand, the crucial project involving the Tesseract, which held the potential to reshape the outcome of the looming conflict with Loki and his Jatari army. Deadpool's sharp wit and quick thinking raised a concerned question. If Nick Fury was already in the lab, who was the man they had just encountered in the meeting hall? With a sense of urgency, they rushed toward the lab, fearing the worst. Before they could enter the lab, however, a group of mutants from the Brotherhood entered the meeting hall. Led by a mutant wearing a lion mask and armed with iron knuckles and a chain, the masked mutant wasted no time in leaping into the air, attacking Beast with his iron-like claws. The rest of the Brotherhood followed suit, using their superpowers to incapable their adversaries. One of the mutants with colossal hands struck Bruce Banner, triggering his transformation into the Hulk. In the midst of the chaos, Beast instructed Deadpool to head inside the lab and check on Clint Barton and the other members. Hulk and Beast, their backs against the wall, engaged the mutants in a fierce battle to protect themselves. As Deadpool entered the lab, he was met with a surreal sight. There were two Nick Furies present. One had been turned into a statue, and the other one held a long spear before his eyes. Nick Fury with the spear transformed into Loki, revealing his true identity. Deadpool taunted the master of deception, Loki. So you're the blumbling magician from Asgard. I wonder why you're here. Earth is already filled with troublemakers like you. Loki challenged him. I have ended many assassinators, careers like yours in the past. Deadpool drew his swords and launched an attack with his best moves. However, Loki with his agility and cunningness easily evaded the blows. Loki could have used his formidable superpowers to overpower Deadpool, but he opted for a more personal approach. Wielding his daggers, Deadpool, well versed in the art of weaponry, managed to land a deep cut on Loki's shoulder, proving that he was not to be underestimated in combat. The battle between the two cunning and skilled adversaries had begun. Loki wasted no time. With a swift push from his scepter, he sent Deadpool flying backwards and approached the machine that held the Tesseract. In a calculated move, he touched the power panel with the glowing blue Tesseract in his hand. The machine immediately ceased to function, and Loki efficiently removed the Tesseract from its confines. Before Deadpool can mount another attack, Loki vanished, leaving behind a malevolent smile. Deadpool emerged from the lab to find a scene of devastation. Hulk and Beast had unleashed their unmatched powers upon the Brotherhood of Mutants. Overwhelming them, Hulk in his towering rage declared triumphy. You see, masked mercenary, we've taken care of them all. Deadpool acknowledged their victory, but didn't let them revel for long. He pointed out the dire situation. Nice work, but Loki managed to escape with the Tesseract. Nick Fury and the others are unconscious inside the lab. With a sense of urgency, they all rushed back into the laboratory, determined to rescue their team members 
and assess the extent of the damage Loki had throttled. As Professor X had heard the news of Loki's attack on the helicarrier, he sent reinforcements. The Blackbird had landed on the helicarrier and all team members of the X-Men climbed down. They stepped towards the meeting hall where Nick Fury and Bruce Banner were waiting for them. Team X-Men including the well-known Prime members like Wolverine, Storm, Mystique, Rogue, along with Quicksilver, Cyclops, and Deadpool and Beast were already present on the helicarrier. First thing Wolverine asked Nick Fury was to shift his headquarters on the ground, as that helicarrier was the most vulnerable target. If Loki attacked, Nick Fury already had ordered the shifting, and he acknowledged the arrival of the X-Men was not lesser than the Avengers team. They shifted the ground headquarters of S.H.I.E.L.D. and waited for the likely Chitauri army. As Loki had stolen the Tesseract, they knew Loki would attack soon, but didn't know the place he chose for attack. He could attack any part of the world, and mutants were ready to face the aliens in any place. They did not have to wait too long, as Nick Fury received a call, and he shouted Loki had attacked Stark Industries headquarters. The X-Men team rushed to the site, and Fury looked for Banner, but he could not find him anywhere. It was a sheer disappointment for him, as the only Avenger had gone missing at the hour of dire need. In the heart of New York City, a battle raged on at the Avengers headquarters, where a formidable assembly of heroes confronted an unholy alliance. Loki the God of Mischief led his cunning Jatari army into battle, their malevolent, plausible, and the chaos they throttled. Magneto, master of magnetism, along with his powerful mutant team, marshaled on the side of Loki, adding an electrifying dimension to the clash. Team X-Men, led by Wolverine, Jean Grey, and Beast, rose to the occasion with unwavering determination. Their powers created a sympathy of destruction and defense, countering Loki's brutal tactics. In the Jatari onslaught, Storm conjured storms, of epic proportions, while Wolverine's animantium claws clash with the Jatari weapons. Jean Grey's telepathic abilities became a crucial asset in the fray. Deadpool's tactics confounded the enemy, and Beast's intellect proved invaluable. In this titanic showdown, the fate of New York City hung in the air. The balance as Earth's heroes fought against the malevolent forces determined to conquer it. As Loki's magical powers began to overwhelm the mutants, a seismic shift in the battle occurred when the Hulk, a behemoth of raw power, bursted onto the scene. With thunderous footsteps, he tore through the battlefield, ripping the alliance between Loki and Magneto in a display of sheer might. Hulk buried Magneto deep within the ground, rendering him powerless while Loki faced the wrath of Hulk's colossal fist. However, just when it seemed like victory was within their grasp, Loki summoned the Tesseract's formidable energy, turning the tide once more. Overcoming Hulk with a brilliant display of magic, Loki had the upper hand, but then something impossible happened. At least Loki did not expect it. Thanos entered the fray. The cosmic conqueror, he roared. Loki, why did you take so much time to overcome the small resistance? Now hand over the Tesseract to me. We're already short on time. Thanos held the head of Captain America in front of the X-Men. The X-Men were in complete disbelief as they saw what Thanos had done. With a little hesitation, Loki was going to hand over the Tesseract to Thanos, but in a shocking twist, Thanos had killed Loki. The X-Men were shocked to see what had happened. Magneto and his team survived the battle and managed to escape, while Thanos towered over the X-Men as they began to fight. And that is going to be 
what if the X-Men were in Avengers 2012? What did you think of the ending where Thanos had killed the Avengers? It leaves a really interesting question if a part two could happen where Thanos is in the Battle of New York with the X-Men. I really wanted to do that twist and really do a change, so I thought, you know, it would be really interesting to see how things play out, and I do want to say, Thanos already has some of the stones on the Infinity Gauntlet, so it's going to be an interesting battle. Would you guys like to see a part two, and if so, should I change the scenario, because now we're kind of getting into, kind of, I feel like we're getting into more of like a end game type of scenario, but that being said, my fellow watchers of the multiverse, if you guys do enjoy these videos, do make sure to subscribe, like, share, and turn those notifications on so you and your friends are up to date with the latest content. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, and have an amazing day. Peace out.